Hello, welcome back to my channel. This is a video about flexural stress. More specifically, we have a T-shaped cantilever beam. That's what this is over here. It's 10 feet long total, broken down into four foot and six foot segments. And we've got planes um, A, B, and C at three different places. Got a uniform distributed load, so three kips per foot over that six foot distance. Um, let's go ahead and pop a coordinate system on here. So we'll do X is the longitudinal axis and Y is the direction in which that load is pointing or the negative Y to be precise. And um, we've got a cross section shown for us here. And notice that the way that this is drawn, let me get my ruler out. The way that this is drawn, oh, so close. All right, I must have eyeballed this one. <laughs> but the idea here is that we can make a connection between this top fiber. There's the picture of the flange and side view over to the right and cross section to the left and then the bottom fiber down here. Okay, so what I want to do is while I'm kind of looking at this cross section, let's go ahead and eyeball that location of the centroid. So remember that we, whenever you can find a line of symmetry, whenever you can find a sim line of symmetry, you know the centroid lies along that line. And we do have this line of symmetry. So we know that the um, centroid lies along that line. And are we top heavy or bottom heavy? Well, we're top heavy. So the centroid is gonna kind of creep up from H over two a little bit higher in the cross section. So we don't know exactly where that centroid is yet, but we can eyeball it and get it into the ballpark. So the idea here is that I've got my centroidal axis of bending Z. I have Y, which is telling me position. I've got my centroid right there. And I need to figure out where that centroidal Z axis is. That means I need to do my centroidal calculation, which is commonly known as calculating Y bar, just like that. Okay. So we are going to need to know that in order to answer the questions posed. And that includes, let's see, we want to figure out the worst case flexural stresses. And once we figure out where those worst case flexural stresses are, we want to construct the distribution of stress or stress distribution at that plane. This is just a mathematical function that shows how flexural stresses vary from the top fiber to the bottom fiber through position coordinate y. Now, why are we plotting that in terms of y? Well, we're just thinking of our flexural stress equation, sigma is equal to minus m y over i. That's the most typical way that you see this um, equation, but if you would like to bring some subscripts to the party, they look like this. X directional be our longitudinal axis. Our axis of bending is z, so we'll do an m sub z and an i sub z, and of course y is telling us position. Okay, I think we are ready to hack at this problem. So we have to do a few things in order to kind of get to this equation, okay? So we need to do some analysis on the cross section. We need to figure out y bar. We need that because we need i sub z. All that's going to go together. In terms of the beam length, we need to do shear moment diagrams to figure out our worst case bending moment. Because if I want worst case or maximum stress, sigma, that means I need to plug in a worst case or maximum bending moment. Um, I think I'm going to do that part first. So let's zoom in over here. Let's mess with our beam and do some shear and moment diagrams of this one. So we'll start with a free body. Just draw a rectangle here to show my beam as a body. And what I'd like to do is convert 
that uniform distributed load into an equivalent force. Um, so what I want to do is be thinking about, okay, there's the right end of that distribution, there's the left end, and I want to put that resultant force right in the middle there. Okay, so there's my F sub R. It's equal to the area under the curve. That's a rectangle with a base of six, a height of three. That's 18 kips right there. Okay, so we're just making a statically equivalent system to figure out our reactions. We can use the geometry to recognize that the distance between the leftmost plane A and our equivalent force is four plus three equals seven feet. Okay, this little notation shows seven feet zero inches. Okay, we are on our way. We are definitely on our way. Oh, that's incredibly interesting. Weird. Okay. Let's do our reaction. So let's start with summation of forces in the y direction equals zero. Over at the fixed support, I pick up all of that 18 kips. Let's pop that in as a reaction. I also need a moment reaction. Whenever you see this fixed plane, do not forget to calculate and include your moment reaction. Assume it's non-zero. It can always coincidentally happen to be zero, but always assume it's non-zero and calculate it. Here we just have to take the product of 18 and 7, and that gives us 126 kips times feet as a reacting moment over at A. Now my free body is in equilibrium. I'm ready to do shear and moment diagrams. Zoom out a little bit. Shear moment diagrams means that I'm just graphically integrating those functions above. And I do like to use kind of these guidelines. So I'll just kind of I'm not going to need that one there for the concentrated load, but I'll need that one. And obviously this one over here. So kind of pop some guidelines there. And then we'll do um, this will be our shear diagram and this will be our moment diagram. And there is a shortcut on this problem. So those of you who say, I already know what the maximum moment is. Why do I have to do shear moment diagrams? It's great that you recognize that. Um, I will go ahead and do them just because it's worth the practice. Okay, so we're going to have shear in kips. My moment is going to be in kips times feet. I'm going to do this quickly because I have other videos on shear moment diagrams uh, that explain this in much greater detail. All right, let's start with shear. I'm going to pick a blue color. Start at zero, increase by 18. Plateau for however many feet that is, four feet. And for the rest of the beam, I want to decrease by the area under the curve. I already computed that to be 18, so I know I'm going to get back to zero. How am I going to get there? Well, my load was constant, so my shear has to be linear like that. It was a linear function. Okay, moment diagram, ready to go. I want to start at zero. I'm going to jump down by 126. Forgetting that is a common error. Another common error is jumping up versus jumping down. So if you haven't got that concept solidified, please see some of the earlier videos, earlier tutorials. I want to increase by this area under the curve. That's an 18 times four. I'm going to add that to the mix. That's going to put us up at negative 54. How am I going to get there? Well, I want to integrate a constant function. So that is a linear one right there. Linear. OK, over the remainder of the beam. So this little segment is um, six feet. Let me make sure I'm remembering all my dimensions correctly. Yes, OK. So this last piece is six feet long. So the area under the curve is I've got a triangle. So I take 6 times 18 divided by 2. That's equal to 54. That gets me back to 0. When I integrate a linear function, that turns into a quadratic curve. And the last thing to figure out is whether it's concave up or concave down. 
And the fast way to do this is this kind of note that this function is decreasing from left to right or going down the hill. You know that that is a concave down function. Another way to think through that is that we've got a value of zero in shear, therefore my slope has to be zero in moments. So there's a couple ways to deduce the correct curve there. All right. That is looking fantastic. I've got shear diagrams, I've got moment diagrams. And why was I doing all this? Well, partially for practice, but also because now I know the worst case moment, that maximum moment does occur at the fixed support. It's equal to 126 kips times feet. So now we know that, let's see. I know that my maximum moment is equal to minus 126 kips times feet, okay? And all that minus sign means is that at that plane, the curvature we have is concave down. We would usually cartoon that kind of in a generic way like this. But if we wanted to put it in a little better context, that left plane does stay fixed. So you could cartoon it like this if you wanted to do so. So there's my negative bending moment. There's that negative bending moment. This plane is tilting. This one is not. And of course, there's an implication that for all these d thetas, we're taking the limit as d theta goes to zero. OK, that was a long story on what that minus sign uh, means there. Let's get this out of here. OK. Let's do some cross section stuff. So all of this and this, that has to do with the cross section itself. Let's start with our Y bar calculation. I am, let's see, how do I wanna do this? I'll go ahead and just kind of zoom in here so that this picture is large on my screen. I'll create another layer so that I can isolate it layer, later. And I will use, and a magenta fuchsia type of color. Okay, so we want to do um, solve y bar. In other words, find location of centroidal z axis. Remember, keep your X's and Y's and Z's straight. You do not want to get those confused in this beam unit because later on we'll do stuff in 3D and it gets a little harder. Okay. All right. So we want to solve Y bar. So our basic procedure for that, I'm going to do this in yellow, which I know won't show up very well, but I don't want to emphasize it. We want to start with this kind of throw away axis down here at the bottom. I'm going to stick with this notation and call that Z prime. I'm going to call that Z prime. Okay, and so what I'm essentially doing in this calculation is taking moments of areas, areas times distances, and comparing them to this benchmark Z prime. That's so I can calculate Y bar right away because Y bar also measures from Z prime. And we always define Y bar as measuring from the bottom fiber to that centroidal horizontal axis. In this case, it's Z, right? Sometimes you might see that as an X. In this case, it happens to be a Z. All right, to do that, I need to break up this geometry into two pieces. So I am gonna do this in this manner. Let's see, Get a little rectangle tool. My top rectangle is gonna be that one. My bottom rectangle will be this one. Top rectangle, I'll call this my shape number one. Bottom rectangle, I'll call this my shape number two. For each of those rectangles, I want to figure out where the centroid is. And one way to do that is to do like these little diagonal lines there and there right, because that tells me exactly where the centroid of component one is. And then I want to do the same thing for rectangle number two. And I'm sorry that the screen is a little pixelated right now. It's because I'm zoomed in. OK, 
Okay, so we could do that as well. And that little geometry tells us, okay, there is the centroid of piece number two. Now to do my moment of inertia, cal I'm sorry, my centroidal calculation. I don't wanna get ahead of myself. I'm gonna have to do moment of inertia in a minute, but my centroidal calculation, the distances that I want measure from that bottom fiber or my Z prime axis to those two centroids. There's one, da, 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 da. okay, so I'll call this distance one. I'll call that distance two, okay? I think we are ready to rock and roll. So I'm gonna zoom out, zoom out just a touch more, put that over there. And let's do this calculation. Okay, so I want to that y bar times my total area is equal to the summation of my areas times the distances. Okay, so y bar is equal to one over my total area. I'm going to plug in eight times two for the top piece plus eight times two for the bottom piece. That's in inches squared, of course, that is just an area. Make my numerator get a little bit bigger there. Put that one there, okay. All right, so what I have done is just taken this formula, my first moment of area, and put my total area on the right side of the equal sign so it's down there in the denominator. And then I'm going to have a big term for A1D1 plus A2D2. My area number one, that's an 8 by 2. My distance number one is 10 minus 1. 10 minus one. Okay, this is A1D1. We're going to add because it tells us to sum up. Now we're ready to do A2D2. And the sum of these two terms is going to be area times distance. So I'm just going to put my inches cubed outside that bracket. All right, area two is also, get this one out of the way. And good. Area two is also an eight by two, right? So 10 minus two is eight, eight times two. So let's plug that one here. And its distance is half of eight. That's four. I'll just write it in full form like that. Okay. All right. multiply all of this out in your calculator and you will get an answer. Oh, let's do the units. Let's do the units. I don't want to forget that. It's important, right? So I've got inches cubed here and inches squared down here. So we are going to get our y bar reported in inches. And um, in terms of calculator operations, you've probably got habits that stick with you. But the way that I would do this is I would start within the parentheses and I would just do a times two times nine plus eight times two times four divided by open parentheses eight times two plus eight times two close parentheses enter. So work on kind of making your calculator operations as efficient and fast as possible. Um, the answer you'll get for this is 6.5 inches and I'll add that information to my diagram up here. 6.5 inches. All right. We have got our Y bar done. All of this stuff right here. So I am going to try a little trick. Let's see if I did all this on the right layer. Good. Control. Paste. Turn that one off. Turn another one on. Okay, we are ready to get into my moment of inertia.
calculation, right? I'm going to need that for my flexural stresses. Zoom back into the cross section for just a second. I'm still going to use areas one and areas two, but now my distances change. So I'm not, oh, I can keep that line actually. I just have to remove this one. And I can remove this one. Okay, so watch carefully how the distances change. This time, we are no longer measuring to this throwaway Z prime axis, right? Get that out of there. It's not part of the problem anymore. We are measuring to the centroidal axis Z. So the whole purpose of doing that Y bar calculation The whole purpose of doing that Y bar calculation was to figure out where Z is. And now we want to measure distances between the components and the Z axis in order to get my moment of inertia. We'll use the parallel axis theorem. We need a little bit more information here on our puzzle. And I'm going to use a light purple for this last piece of information. Okay. So from the centroidal Z axis to the top fiber of the cross section is a total height of 10 minus 6.5. There's my 10, there's my 6.5. So I subtract that out and I get 3.5 inches there. Okay. While I'm zoomed in, let's just go ahead and solve for D1 and D2. D1, this is where a lot of mistakes are made, by the way. So all you want to do is take this 3.5 to the top and then take that little distance out. So start at the centroid, up 3.5 minus 1. That distance 1 is 2.5 inches. Okay, and you're never going to have positive or negative signs with these terms because you're about to square them. So it doesn't matter. Just think of these as magnitudes. Um, here is D2. So here I want to think about starting at the centroid, going down 6.5, and then I want to take out, put this one in purple to the side to make sure it's clear. I want to take out this little dimension. Do, do, do. Do, 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 do. That one is half of eight. So that is a four inch dimension there. Okay, so D2 is going to be 6.5 minus four or 2.5 inches. Okay, it is just a coincidence that these happen to be the same for this particular problem. It's actually not a coincidence. I gave you this cross section because I know that you get nice um, round numbers and that you wouldn't have to mess with a whole lot of decimals. Okay, so that is the reason behind all this. We're ready to do our moment of inertia. I'll do that in orange right here. Moment of inertia about the Z axis equals, we're going to apply the parallel axis theorem. So the summation of the moments of inertia about their own horizontal centroidal axes plus the summation of the areas times the distances squared. Here are those horizontal axes. I will add them to our picture that's kind of becoming a little congested, but that's okay. So here is the centroidal Z axis or horizontal axis of shape two. And this is the one for shape number one, those two yellow lines there. All right, let's plug and chug through our equation. When I'm doing this on my own, I often use the tabular format, but I'll go ahead and write it out longhand for this tutorial. All right, so I sub one plus I sub two plus A one D one squared plus A two D two squared. Moment inertia of shape number one about its own centroidal axis. I got a base of eight. I've got a height of two cubit divided by 12. Next shape, moment shape number two. I've got a base of two. I've got a height of eight cube it divided by 12. Next term, area one is an eight 
by 2. d sub 1 is 2.5. Don't forget to square it. Plus a2 d2 squared, that's also an 8 times 2. It coincidentally also has a distance of 2.5. Don't forget to square it. Always show units, but also don't, you know, show them in ways that make good sense. This is length to the fourth, length to the fourth, length to the fourth, length to the fourth. So just put inches to the fourth at the end there. And you will get a moment of inertia about the centroidal z-axis of 290.6 bar inches to the fourth. Since this is just an intermediate step, I'm not done with the problem yet. I do want to keep all of those digits in my calculator, so I will continue to think of this and punch it in as 290.6 bar. Okay, whew. A lot of time, right, to do these centroidal calculations and moment of inertia. The good news is the more practice you get, the faster you will become. And you will need to be able to do those calculations at a decent speed in terms of exams. So the more practice, the better you'll get faster and more accurate and have fewer errors. But it does, it does require investment of time in order to do that. OK, I'll just write that um, conclusion. We just figured out that I sub z is 290.6 bar inches to the fourth. And finally, we are ready to figure out our stresses. All right, what are we doing on this problem? We want to figure out a stress distribution. Here's what is meant by that, OK? A stress distribution can be drawn in 2D or in 3D. I will choose 2D. I'm drawing the cross section at left, and I'm drawing just some horizontal lines at right. Okay, so there is my top piece. This is obviously eyeballed and not super to scale, but that's okay. So there's a picture of my cross section. And on this line right here, I want to plot my flexural stresses. Okay, I'm going to want to do that in KSI, kips per square inch. And I want to do that through position y. So we know our centroidal z axis is here. y is measuring position up to the top fiber down to the bottom. So in other words, this line represents the stress that lives at this very top fiber. This line down at the bottom, that's going to tell me the stress at the bottom. So we're looking at a side view. We just want to plot this mathematically. Okay. This is the simplest way to do a stress distribution. You could do it as a differential slice, like a DX slice, and you'll have two that are mirror images from each other. And of course, you could do it in 3D as well, but that starts to become a little more complicated to draw. All right, here's how I'm going to approach this. So my flexural stress sigma is equal to minus my moment max, plug in that, minus 126. And I'm going to multiply that by 12 to go from kips times feet over to kips times inches. I'm doing that because I'm thinking ahead about what units my stresses are going to be in. So let's do a preemptive conversion over from kips times feet to kips times inches. The denominator is easy. So that moment of inertia about the axis of bending or the z axis is 290.6 bar inches to the fourth. And in the numerator, I want to do two different values of y. So I'm going to put a little bracketed term here. You can think of this as a little matrix. Okay. And if I start at the centroidal and go up to the top fiber, 
I'm going to use y equals positive 3.5 inches. That's h minus y bar. And if I go to the bottom fiber, I'll plug in y equals y bar. And it's going to get a negative sign because I'm going in the opposite direction of positive y. So here I'll plug in minus 6.5 inches. So 3.5 inches will be one calculation. And then I'll do another calculation with minus 6.5. So a little bit of matrix type notation um, up in the numerator there. All right, so what we're going to see here, obviously these two minus signs are going to cancel each other out. So we look at the units, let's go ahead and do our unit analysis. So I've got inches to the fourth in the denominator. I have inches times inches up here. So this is going to go to inches squared. And so that's how I know that I'm going to output KSI kips per inches squared in the next step. OK. KSI. And I'll do my little bracket notation. In fact, I'll give myself a little more room. You don't have to do it by this way, this way, by the way, you could write out the equation twice and be like, oh, the stress at the top is blah, blah, blah. The stress at the bottom is blah, blah, blah. This is just a different way to do it. So I'm just going to say at the top, positive 3.5 inches, and we'll figure out that number there and a number here at the bottom. All right, so for calculator operation, here is what I would do. 126 times 12 times 3.5 divided by 290.6 equals, drum roll, where is my pre-calculation? 18.2, right? And that's a positive sign because that distance is positive and those negative signs cancel each other out. Okay, now to get the other one, I've still got this number in my calculator. And so all I need to do is divide by 3.5 and multiply by minus 6.5 to get the other one. So that will end up with a negative sign there, 33.8. KSI units for both of these. Okay, if I know those two extremes, I'm ready to plot them on my stress distribution. All right, it's conventional to put tension on the left, compression on the right. If you deviate from this and label it, I'm okay with that. OK, but it's most conventional to do tension on the left, compression on the right. I know it feels backwards when you look at it this way. But all I have to do is use the magic of my tablet to turn it 90 degrees. And then tension is above the line and compression is below the line, which is the way we're used to looking at mathematical functions. OK, so it's just a convention thing. All right, uh, let me zoom this, turn this back around. OK. Plot those key points. So at the top of our function, I have tension, 18.2. So I'm plotting it on the tension side. I've got units down here, so I don't need to write the units again unless I just want to do so. At the, the axis of bending, which is here, that has a stress of zero by definition because that fiber lies on the neutral surface, the neutral axis. My flexural stresses are zero there. Okay. I know that this function will be linear in y. That's what my equation says. So I'll go ahead and draw it as a nice straight line linear function. Plot this other value as 33.8. 
I do know that some of you do like to put negative signs with your plots. I am not a fan of that. And the reason why is because my axes tell me everything I need to know about the sign. That said, if you like those signs and want to add one there, that is OK. In this instance, that does not make the results ambiguous. Um, so that would be OK in this instance. All right, so what have we done here? Let's step back. This problem has several steps, right? This is kind of our answer right here. This is not the only way to convey that answer. This is not the only way to convey that answer. Let me walk you through the problem real quick one more time, and then I'll sketch it in 3D with the caveat that I'm doing this live, and it may not look very good. OK, all right, so what have we done here? We have this shape. We figured out our worst case moment either by inspecting the context and recognizing that that moment's going to govern, or by doing the work, doing the moment diagram, and realizing that this is my worst case bending moment. It happens to be negative. Okay, this diagram tells me conclusively that I've got negative bending. When I try to sketch this concave shape up above, I'll do this with a black marker. And I'm greatly exaggerating this. Ooh, that curve was yuck. Try that again. That's not so bad right there. That is not so bad. OK, so this shape that I've just drawn there is my deflected shape, deflected geometry. Here is that neutral. Oops. It's a little top heavy. So there's my neutral axis, axis of bending. We can see tension on top. So we know we have tension up here. Everything above that line, we know we have compression down here. And the absolute max tension occurs right there, right there, right next to the support. That color didn't work. How about that one? There we go. My maximum compression occurs right there. And this value is the one we calculated. This value is the one we calculated. And so what we are showing in our stress distribution is at this plane right there, our material is feeling more pain, more stress in that plane than any other plane along the length of the member. This is where it's connected back to the support. Okay, this drawing here, this drawing here is displaying that same information. It's telling us our flexural stresses have a max tension, top fiber 18.2, max compression 33.8 KSI bottom fiber. And then of course, right here, where Y is equal to zero, then my stress is equal to zero as well. Okay. Another way to think of this plot, let me show you this one more time because I know this is tricky, tricky geometry. So my position coordinate is y. I'm plotting stress. I'm plotting stress. And that plot is the one that makes more sense when I turn it this way, because you're accustomed to reading plots with position going to the right. Now, usually it's an X and not a Y, okay? But with position, location going to the right, and whatever it is you're studying going upwards, okay? So as soon as you turn this, this plot maybe feels more familiar to you, but this is the way it's often drawn because that way we can connect it to the cross section. Right. So in other words, if I asked, like, let's say on a test, I gave you this picture and I was like, hey, students, what's the stress right there at that blue dot? And, you, and if I've given you the stress distribution, all you have to do is do a little bit of linear interpo interpolation to kind of figure out that, hey, that stress correlates to that fiber. Or maybe just for one more example, at the risk of being overly redundant, what about this one? Oh, well, that stress is right there. Right, so figure out what this is based on that position coordinate Y.
So you, these things are pretty useful once you've got them constructed to figure out all of the stresses. Okay, as promised, I will end this with a little sketch in 3D and I'll try to make this look okay. In 3D, I'm going to push this one at 30 degrees. Okay, so I'll do, let me get another, okay, I'm good. All right, so I've got this, I've got this, and I've got way down here, this. Drawing this like a 3D, oh, I missed that line, didn't I? That's okay. 3D axonometric drawing, commonly miscalled an isometric at lines. And that's a philosophical discussion for another day. Okay. But there's my cross section. And instead of doing an isometric, I'll just pick a random angle here. Let's see what angle that needs to be. How about 60? Let's put that one at 60. And boop. 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 OK. My centroid is right. Right about there. So there is my centroid. There is my x axis, which is longitudinal. This is my y axis. And this one at 30 degrees. That is my z axis. X, Y, and Z. Okay, we have a bending moment about Z. Longitudinal is X. So what I want to do is recreate this stress distribution in 3D. I'm going to turn down the volume on that, put on a new layer. Thanks for listening to me narrate my process. Let's see how this goes. All right, let's start with this one, so 60. And at the bottom of this beam, I'll use a pink color to pull a pink color to pull with 33.8 KSI of tension. Okay, so this is 33.8 KSI of tension. And I can emphasize the tension. You can always put little arrows on this thing if you want to help visualize that, okay? Now get my handy straight edge. That function decreases linearly. Uh, my drawing's a little messed up, so pretend like those lines are parallel. Close enough, right? Gets linearly decreased until we get to that little fiber right there. Maybe I'll make that a little bit thicker. Okay, so this material right there is the stuff that's feeling no pain. It only has, it has a stress of zero. It has a stress of zero. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. It's, I'm doing this live, so it takes a while to do some of these drawings so that they make good sense. That said, I think it's probably good for you to see this at least once. Okay, so we're out, we do have tension, all these fibers pulling, 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 but they're increasing linearly as I go from top to bottom. So there is a pulling stress, pulling stress, pulling stress, pulling stress, decreasing until I get to zero there, zero there. All those little points are zero at the axis of bending. All right, so now I'm going to color my tension zone that same color of pink. Just outline it. That's black. That's not pink. <laughs> outline it like this. You know what, I'm just going to color it in. That's going to be just as fast. All right. 
there is my stress distribution, the tensile part of it, drawn in 3D in pink. Can you correlate that back to this bottom triangle right there? I hope so. All right, let's do the compression. I'm going to switch over to blue for that. New layer, new color. And let's do a little more line work. All right. Get my ruler tool. I want to keep this in that longitudinal or x direction. Now I want to be pushing, not with 33.8, but with a smaller magnitude of that, what was it, 16 or something? 18, 18.2. So I'm going to graphically reduce the length of this line. And let's see. I'm going to cut it off about there. Okay, I'm going to freehand this just to kind of pick up the pace a little bit. If you're still watching this, I'm very pleased with your patience. Okay, so pushing, 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 pushing. I come straight down here. I take the linear distribution, this is where it's going to get really hard to draw, right there. So I have a smaller stress there. The stress up here at the peak, that is equal to 18.2 KSI of compression. That's the pushing on the cross section. And I can't, like with the perspective of this particular drawing, I cannot in 3D show you the same amount of information as I could do in 2D. What I will do is go ahead and just kind of color this compressive function. Yeah, put, yeah, that's what I want, this layer here. I will just go ahead and color this all blue so we can see the location of the compression. But this block of stress is covering up what's happening down below. So I would need to do a 3D model if I wanted to fully show you this in 3D. And that's why these 2D diagrams do just as well, if not better, than the three-dimensional picture here. All right, I hope this was helpful. I know it was lengthy. Thanks for hanging with me to the end. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. Have a great day, and I hope that this video was informative for you.